Hello, and welcome to How I Built This, Resilience Edition from NPR. This is where we talk with entrepreneurs and other business leaders about how they are building resilience during these very challenging times. Um, before we begin, I want to thank um, NPR sponsor HubSpot for their support of this episode. Legacy CRM platforms have made you compromise for far too long. With HubSpot CRM platform, you don't have to choose between enterprise tools that are powerful or easy to use. It gives you both, so your marketing, sales, and service teams can align with ease, accelerate sales, and every customer need. Finally, there's a CRM platform that helps you run better so you can grow better without complexity ever getting in the way. Learn more at HubSpot.com. Thank you, HubSpot. That's how we're able to make these shows. Okay, on to today. My guest today is Emily Powell. She's the owner and president of the world-famous and legendary Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. It's one of the biggest family-owned independent booksellers in the world. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's such a thrill to be here. We really appreciate uh, the invitation. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. And if you're watching um, on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube, however you're watching, um, you can submit questions for Emily, and we'll get to as many of those as we can um, over the next half hour. So first of all, um, Emily, um, how are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm you? sitting on the floor of my bedroom with the door locked to keep my six-year-old from running in in the middle of his Zoom classes. Uh, uh, I'm tired. I think we're all tired. You know, it's been a long year. I'm hanging in there. I got a warm house and, you know, food and my people are safe and healthy. So I have a lot to be grateful for. But I think we're all feeling pretty worn down at this point in the year. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how your business has has kind of coped with with um, the turmoil this year. But I want to just kind of for for those who who aren't familiar with Powell's, I mean, this is an incredible bookstore. I've been there. It's just an amazing. Thank you. <laughs> you've, had, you've had an online presence since 1994. Powell's dot com. Um, That's right. And you grew up in this business. Like your dad Correct. started a bookstore. Your grandfather started Powell's. Um, mm -hmm. You were around this world from the time you were a little kid. Um, did, right. you, did you always know that you wanted to take over the, the family business and, and pursue yeah. this this path? Yeah, you know, there's a story in my family about my grandfather used to drive a really beat up Chevy pickup truck. And I thought it was the coolest thing to go riding in his pickup truck. It was the first company car, you know, it had the Powell's logo on the side. And I would say, at, you know, the age of three or five, oh, when I grow up, I want to drive the bookie truck. That was my grand aspiration <laughs> to drive his pickup truck. So yeah, I had a pretty good sense um, from an early age. When you grow up in a place that's as magical as Powell's, you know, it was big early uh, and fast. I don't know anyone who would have turned that down. I think as an opportunity, it's pretty, it's pretty wonderful. Um, I also read something that you you said that that you don't think that Powell's would have survived or thrived anywhere else except for Portland. Um, yeah. What? Why? What? Why do you think so? Well, a couple of reasons, you know, um, my father was always really involved in the in the city community and our politics and the development of the real estate. And, you know, the, we have a streetcar that runs through downtown Portland. He was a port commissioner. So we talked a lot around the dinner table about what makes a city work, what makes a city vital and vibrant. And Portland's done a lot of things right since the 70s. They've been very deliberate about how they planned the city and how it might look in the year 2000 or in this case, 2020. Um, there aren't a lot of cities that have the same makeup that allow for that kind of vibrant downtown pedestrian environment. So we say to be successful, we need 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. pedestrian traffic. Not a lot of cities have that. They have portions of that, um, but we have it in spades. And then we have our weird, you know, at this point, everyone knows Portland is, is a little weird. It's a little different. We have a very vibrant arts um, and literary culture here, which I think we've helped participate and contribute to grow. Um, but um, I think this is a city that believes it has to support itself in order to keep going. And that's allowed us to survive. And I think other cities maybe miss that point occasionally. Yeah. Um, so again, for anyone who's been to Portland, you probably have gone to Powell's because it's a also a tourist attraction because it's such a huge, well-known landmark um, in the city. And, um, and I imagine that, you know, starting in March, February, March, April, when it started to become clear that that this COVID thing was real. Mm -hmm. um, well, kind of walk me through what what was going on at, at sure. the store and what you started to notice. 
Well, uh, it's easy to forget at this point in the year that Oregon actually had one of the first cases in the United States. So we were tracking the virus pretty early. I remember being away in February going, oh, maybe we want to stock up on soup or something, you know, thinking about it. We were watching it. We were talking about it and our management team. And um, Friday the 13th, you know, was when things started to, to sort of grow in the Portland area. We were hearing from customers, we were hearing from employees, but more importantly, we were thinking, oh, what, this isn't going in a good direction. Um, so on um, Sunday of that weekend, you know, we had been talking as a management team on the phone most of the weekend. And, and what had happened was our, the county libraries closed. Um, and we are so large and such a uh, safe interior space in March in Oregon that a lot of people look for places for shelter. And so the folks who might have spent their afternoons in the library came to Powell's, which is great, except that now we had a lot more people in the store than we would have. Um, and so at Sunday, 11 a.m., we made the decision, maybe it was even earlier, we have to close right now. You know, this is starting to feel unsafe. No matter what, we cannot participate in spreading this virus in our community. The governor hadn't moved yet to close us down. I think a lot of folks thought we were responding to, you know, a demand. But no, we felt really the compulsion that we need to do what we have to to protect Portland. And, and so we shut down in the middle of the day. We moved everyone out of the store. And then unfortunately laid off most of our employees, you know, within 24 hours, because if people aren't buying books, we don't have the ability to keep operating. So you shut the store down entirely. Um, and I imagine, I mean, because this is totally unprecedented. Yes. You probably didn't have a plan for what to do. I mean, the answer was just, let's just shut down. And, but it wasn't That's like, right. shut down and move online, right? I mean, you right. didn't. We have our e-commerce business, which is successful, but in the in the moment, we fully expected that the governor was going to require all you know non-essential businesses to shut down, and for us, that meant our warehouse that operates Powell's.com. So we laid off a, quite a number of employees, in large part because we expected we were going to zero. We expected we were turning all the lights off. We would not be shipping anything out, um, but I was in touch with her team, and they said, no, we want you to keep your, you know, your internet business going. We want as many people employed as we possibly can have and on health insurance during this time. And I said, okay, we can do that. So we pivoted as quickly as we could um, to bring some people back, not knowing if we'd have any business to pay them. Um, but we had a pretty big spike in orders within the first couple of weeks of the shutdown in March. And that allowed us to kind of plow through the first month or two um, before we could get, get our wits about us. So, I mean, within such a short period of time, you had to lay off a huge number, because I think you've got seven physical stores in Portland, right? We did have, um, I get the math wrong, <laughs> we had five, uh, we're down to, we just closed our airport store and our home and garden store permanently. So now we have our, uh, we have three at this point. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, so, so let's kind of talk through, you know, there was an initial spike in, in, right. in online sales because, for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. people were staying at home and and, right. and were hunkered down. Um, now we're you know sort of nine months into this. Um, tell me where where things stand right now. I mean, presumably, Powell's the the bookstore. You are allowing people in, but but a, a limited number of people in. That's right. So we closed our all of our stores. We kept our internet business going um, over the summer. Um, at, towards the end of the summer, we were able to open um, our, we have a suburban store that's a bit, one very big space. So we felt much more comfortable just opening that store to a limited number of people as a sort of test place to practice. Our other stores have a lot more. We're sort of known for, well, this room leads to that room and there's this little hall and that's there, there's this corner. And so we had to be a lot more cautious in thinking through how to open those stores. Uh, but we did open um, this fall, limited days, limited hours, a much different experience. The downtown store, which is our flagship, it's a whole city block. Parts of it are four stories high. Um, we just have a few select rooms open there. Um, and of course, we're limiting the number of folks in the store. So it's a much different feel than you would normally have encountered if you'd come shopping at Powell's even a year ago. And and how much of your overall sales and revenue depends on people actually walking up and down the aisles versus the e-commerce side? Well, of course, it's it, it's <laughs> the numbers are all over there, uh, all over the place at the moment. Originally, you know, pre-pandemic, we would have said our internet business was maybe 20% of our overall sales. So a substantial portion of our business is still in-person, very tourism dependent at this point in Oregon's um, history. Um, now, uh, all of our sales, you know, collectively, we're down about 
75 to 80%. So the bulk is now online, but we really depend on what's happening in store because the internet can't support, you know, we have 200 people back working for us now. Um, we need both of those legs under the table. So, I mean, as the CEO of the company, are you, you're the, you're, or you're currently the CEO of the company? I just hired a CEO this fall, actually. There was just too much work and it's right. sort of a bizarre time to bring, to add to headcount and bring someone on, but we were all buckling under the weight of the challenges. And so yeah. we've had, we've brought him on. It's been a great addition. How have you, um, I mean, I know that you were also, uh, you know, you, you led the company through the the end of the last financial crisis, yeah. um, and and so you've dealt with crises before. That's right. Um, I mean, it sounds like initially it was about sort of stopping the bleeding. Yes. And 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 where are you now? I mean, is it is it ha, have you do you feel like that's been stopped and that you are now on a more sort of stable footing, even though at a diminished right. you know, at a diminished level of diminished sales level? You know, if I could show you my fingernails, you'd see how short they are. Um, you know, first I would say, just to back up, uh, we're in the independent book selling business. That's never been an industry in which we're used to uh, either being very financially successful or seeing much, you know, continued success. We're used to being scrappy and yeah. creative. We're used to saying, oh, that snowed on that Saturday. What are we going to do? You know, that ate up our month or um, so it's not unfamiliar territory to be in a financially challenging time. This is, of course, an entirely different scale. I would say, uh, first of all, if not for the PPP program, we wouldn't be here today. You know, fundamentally, our loan that we received, so we shut down May, March 15th, we received our loan in early May. If not for that loan, we wouldn't have been able to bring people back to work and continue operating through the summer and frankly buy time to figure out how we were going to do this. Um, at this point, of course, those funds are exhausted, but we've been able to open the stores that's helping internet business has remained somewhat steady. Um, but no, it's not sustainable. You know, that's the bottom line. And so what we're just doing is trying to find ways to grab the little bits of business we can and think very creatively about how to manage expense. So in that sense, you know, this year has certainly taught us a lot more nimbleness. Oh, this bill is here today. Where's the money for, you know, for that coming from? We'll worry about next week, next week. Um, but at the same time, we have to look ahead. So we're doing that. We're trying to find strategies to get us. I think, you know, we have to get another six to 12 months under our belts before we can breathe a sigh of relief. Emily, how are you? I mean, one of the things that Powell's was known for were events. You had right. in-store events. And I mean, it wasn't just a place where you bought books. It was you, you have a community and that's the value proposition. It's not just yes. going to Amazon and clicking and buying a book. Like right. when you go to Powell's, there's all of this other stuff that you yes. get. You get great sales folks and mm -hmm. you get these events and and so how have you have you been able to migrate some of that um to 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 to, to the virtual space like have you been able to do virtual events and, and yep. things like that we have done virtual events we've had a good turnout for those you know the challenge i think so many retailers are facing right now is our business in the year 2019, let's say, it was increasingly an experienced business. It's a place to go. You know, a lot of business people talk about the third place. It's something to go and you spend time with your friends or your family. You get a cup of coffee and you buy something and it's an experience. And Powell's is that, of course, in spades, if you haven't been there, it is usually mobbed. There's usually at least one event happening at any given moment. Um, there's a lot to take in and we can't, we can't offer that right now. So, you know, we haven't been able to replace that. And, and the reality is also a lot of folks are doing events online these days and they're very compelling. And um, it's not the same for us as having an in-store event. There's just a different, you know, feel to it. So we're doing our best, but, you know, I would say, you know, that's someplace we need to find some improvement. One of the decisions that you made um, was to pull Powell's from Amazon. Amazon that's is right. no longer a sales channel for Powell's, which, um, you know, I think you, you, you compare it to like, quitting smoking. Yes. That, no you know, offense to smokers, but <laughs> it's, it's an addiction that, that you kind of relied on, but you decided it was, it was an important decision to make. Um, That's right. Ha, has that, um, has that been, you know, has it been challenging to, to, to try and maintain that um, this year or, I mean, how, how has that worked out so far? Well, it was an interesting conundrum uh, in the spring because we had a huge sales spike. We needed to service our direct 
Powell's customers first and foremost. And at the same time, Amazon was having the same experience. And so they weren't prioritizing our orders on Amazon either. So it was an appropriate moment to part ways. It was not an appropriate moment in the sense of cash flow. I mean, who in the middle of a pandemic in which you've lost, you know, 80% or more of your sales would say, no, thanks. I won't take your, you know, your money. I, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So it was uh, logical, but painful at the same time. That being said, it was a pretty straightforward and easy choice for us. We need to focus on our business. We need to focus on our customers. And Amazon is never going to help us be successful in the long run. They're going to help Amazon be successful. And I don't believe that's good for Powell's. It's certainly not good for our community. So it wasn't something we had to put a lot of brain power behind, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's a question that's come in from uh, one of our viewers, Paul Drysback, via LinkedIn. And Paul says he's a local Portlander, um, loves Powell's, um, has supported the store for years, um, and writes, I often see that prices are higher than you know, than the same product on Amazon and on other online sellers. So he asked, how, can you explain the discrepancy and, and how do you, you know, sort of how do you, how do you stay competitive against, against Amazon online sellers when sometimes their yeah. prices may be lower? Well, the, the, to answer the last question first, I'd say we don't, you know, we've never been able to stay competitive. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things going on that impact that price. One, if it's Amazon selling a new book, they're getting a different price. You know, they're buying that from the publisher at a much lower cost than we are. We can't buy as many units as they can, and so we don't get the same discount. Um, on the other hand, you also have folks who are selling out of their home. I'm sitting in my home now. You know, they're not, they don't have employees. They have to pay health insurance, too, or the same kind of local taxes. Or So there's a cost to doing business that folks like Powell's or any other independent bookseller, for that matter, um, have to put in before they can, you know, um, complete their day, essentially. Um, so it's almost impossible for us to be competitive on a price basis for us or, again, any other independent retailer. Um, I think it's worth it. I mean, if I didn't think it was <laughs> worth it, I wouldn't be here, I suppose. But we employ, you know, historically 500 people. I think we make can pay a competitive wage. We have a great benefits package. We support local community nonprofits. Um, we're engaged in the community. I think that means your dollar is going someplace that's really valuable as opposed to, to Amazon where it goes out of state. Um, you know, we've all read the news these days. They're not the best employer. They're not taking care of their people. Um, but they're also not supporting small businesses that allow our local economies to thrive. So um, I think we're competitive in a different way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, going back to your, to your employees, um, I mean, you, you mentioned that you had to lay off like something like 90 percent of your employees in the first That's few right. days. Um, how, how many have you been able to um, to bring back? So we're, uh, you know, the number fluctuates a little bit, especially in this year of COVID, but we're right around 200 employees. We were about 500 before this. So we're still nowhere close to where we'd like to be. Um, and, you know, frankly, we don't know how this holiday season is going to go. And we will probably, we're expecting we'll have to contract again, um, which is not something we want to do, but it's just how it is this year. Have, have I mean, and presumably you've had employees who were worried about coming back, right? It just, just Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we have a, the whole range of, I think, emotions around this time um, this year. Some folks who are really eager to be back, who want to do what they can, who are eager to be um, out of their house. And we have others who really don't feel comfortable at all. And I completely understand and respect the situation we all find ourselves in, depending on our personal situations. You know, just getting on a bus and going to work is suddenly a stressful thing. We, we took that for granted a year ago. Um, child care is, is is hugely stressful, so um, it's a real conundrum. Emily, you know one of the again, like one of the things about the in-store experience is you read reviews from people who work at Powell's, or you know Powell's Powell's will pick books that they like, and and people trust that. Have you been able to move some of that online as well to um, to sort of continue yeah. that? Well, in that way, we were well positioned. I mean, we've always tried to try to translate the in-store experience of Powell's onto our website. And I think, you know, if we if this were a technology conversation, I'd say that's a little bit of a red herring and there's a lot of work we can do there. But we were ready in that sense. We have a lot of content from our booksellers. And that's what we pride ourselves in is the books we've selected, the books we've read, the books we're ready to talk to you about. You know, my dad works in our warehouse almost five days a week. He's supposed to watch my kiddo, but he'd rather be in the warehouse. Uh, he'll tell me uh, pricing used books. It, that is our bread and butter, knowing these unusual items that you're just not going to find easily anywhere else and trying to connect those books to our readers. 
is what gets us up in the morning. Um, here's another question. Um, this is from Ian. Ian asks, um, what do you think it is about Powell's that that continue that you know continues to to draw crowds and devotees year after year, which it has, despite the fact that you know um, there's been a decrease in in print media readership, you know, over the past decades compared to digital readership. What what do you think explains it? You know, I think one of the wonderful things about books is you don't have to actually think of yourself as a reader or a book lover to find something in them. And and as a as a retailer, you know, a lot of shops are also there for one gender or one interest level or, you know, this is where you go for the sport, whatever. Yeah, books aren't like that. Everyone and everything can find something uh, in a bookstore. And when you display the human experience more or less in its entirety on shelves in, in a physical space and folks have the opportunity to explore that in a very tangible way. I think it's pretty captivating and compelling. And again, you don't have to say, oh, I need to find a book to read. You just have to say, I need to fix my car, you know, or I need to figure out how to uh, lose some weight. Uh, you know, we've got a book on that. And once you've started your journey down the road, you know, in one of our aisles, you get kind of sucked in. Um, so in that regard, I don't think it really has anything to do with media. I think it has to do with being alive and being curious. And we try to keep that experience um, as engaging as possible. This is a question from Beth, um, sort of asking you to put on your, your entrepreneur's hat, which is what, <laughs> what are ways that, that you help to keep costs down, um, you know, as, as you got started in the business and you started to take over the business? What are, what are some of the ways that you, you know, work to make sure that you could stay competitive? Yeah, the answers are really not sexy. They're things like we didn't repair the roof. You know, we had, if you walked into the main entrance of our store for years, there were buckets hanging from the ceiling. Um, you know, it's being really creative about what is essential this year. Is, is the HVAC repair essential this year or is it not? Can we spend money on a new search engine? You know, um, so we, we talk a lot about um, you know, some companies might have a platinum standard or a copper standard. We've got the duct tape standard. You know, we're just going to patch things together here because what's most important is the essential beating heart of the business. So that's what always gets the attention. Everything else can wait. So, Emily, I imagine that over the years there has there have been opportunities to expand Powell's beyond Portland, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I imagine you've been asked or, or, or been approached. That's right, yeah. And, yeah, and what what's kind of kept you – kept you from doing that, kept you kind of focused only on in the Portland area? Well, I'd say two things. One, it goes back to that urban planning uh, conversation we had a little bit earlier. Most cities don't have a neighborhood that is uh, an obvious fit. And I know that probably sounds strange to think of so many wonderful places to be, but they have to have that morning to nighttime, you know, possibility for business. And then they have to have affordable rent. <laughs> and if you could think about a beautiful part of, say, Manhattan or San Francisco, well, the rent's just not going to support a bookstore. So even just financially finding a place that would be viable is, is near impossible. But the more important piece for me is, is a value point, and that's I believe books are a deeply personal product and a consumption process, and that means we need to know our community pretty intimately, and I don't want to presume to take my business into, say, Austin, Texas, and know exactly what that community is going to want and be able to, to meet their needs where they are without being there for a good 10 or 20 years first. So um, we're going to stay in Portland. Have there been things that you've done this year that you think you will continue to do after the pandemic ends? Hopefully not bite my nails quite so much. Um, you know, I pride myself. I'm proud of Powell's and being a very, I would say, emotionally intelligent business in that we recognize that it's the full human being that shows up at work every day. And boy, this year has reminded us of that in spades. So I'd say that's something we'll certainly be paying even more attention to. You know, everyone's got complex lives and they're played out on a daily basis. It doesn't turn off from 9 a.m. to, you know, 5 p.m. Um, being able to be more flexible. We're a 50 year old company. We're about to be 50 years old. We're kind of a big ship for what we are and we move pretty slow. But this year we've had to get comfortable moving a little faster and trying things that we're not quite as prepared to try. So I think, you know, I think we're scrappy, but certainly being scrappier, being a little more flexible, um, being a little more creative. Um, it's just turned the heat up. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. By the way, are you seeing consumers um, kind of you know, given that you are an independent business, I mean, mm -hmm. are you seeing, and given the, you know, the economic crisis in the country, are you seeing more consumers um, 
making conscious decisions to support businesses like yours versus an Amazon or you know Walmart? Um, I mean, are you do, are you are you seeing that kind of very deliberate um, pattern among among shopper consumers? I think so. You know, I I have a I have a viewpoint of one business alone, and it's mine. So it's a little bit hard for me to say. Um, and I would, it's also a little hard for me to say, because we, I think, have benefited from that kind of support for a very long time. You know, uh, we've certainly heard from customers for decades that that's one of the reasons they shop with us, because we're not always going to be price competitive. We're probably going to slip ship your book slower than, you know, somebody else might. Um, so I know that that's a big reason people support us at, at the end of the day. But I do think that there's been an uptick in that. We hear from folks more and more. Um, this is my choice this year more than any other year. I don't go to my office very often these days. I try to keep my body out of, you know, one less headcount in our office space. But when I do, I've usually got a pile of letters waiting for me from people around the world saying thank you for what you're doing or thank you for standing up to Amazon. Um, so that tells me something. That certainly tells me this matters to people. Being an independent bookstore matters. Um, before I let you go, I've got to ask you about some of your favorite books that you're reading right <laughs> now because we're getting a lot of questions about that. I, I've got a huge pile I'm the worst uh, book buyer in the sense that I'm just probably like a lot of our customers I go in and I buy five books when I've got you know 20 sitting next to my uh, right. nightstand right um, you know I've been reading a lot of poetry this year because it's short I don't have a lot of time I'm working more than ever um, and I need something that's going to pack a pretty big wallop so um, I picked up a couple of uh, titles by Jericho Brown who won the Pulitzer this year it's pretty powerful stuff um, and then I've got a Salman Rushdie, you know, I need a novel. I think a lot of folks are reading books about not right now, <laughs> any story that they can take you out of this yeah. moment. So I've got Midnight's Children next to my bed. Um, and then I'm always sort of dipping in and out of at least half a dozen other things. So they trail me around the house. That's awesome. Um, Emily Powell of Powell's Books in Portland. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been such a treat. I appreciate it. Very and much. and 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 by the way, if you want to buy my book, buy it to Powell's.com. <laughs> please, and buy it to, please, yes, buy it to Powell's.com. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everybody for watching. A couple quick announcements before we go. Um, please come back here next Thursday. We're gonna have another live conversation, same place, same time, um, with another entrepreneur about how they're adopting their business. This week on the podcast, we re we um, re released our episode with Tony Shea of Zappos, who tragically passed away last week. Check that out. Um, next week we have a new episode out. It's with Joel Clark of Kodiak Cakes. It's now the third biggest pancake mix company in in the country. So it's a really crazy story. Fifteen years of failure to finally um, achieving success. So it's a really amazing story. Um, thank you again, Emily. So great having you. Good luck this holiday season. Anybody watching, please buy books at independent bookstores like Powell's. Go to Powell's.com and other local bookstores, independent bookstores to get your books and help these businesses out. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.